Hello, and welcome back to another amazing episode of Be Kind Connects. I'm your host, Shabnam Islam. And joining us today in the studio is the iconic Dr. Columbus Batiste. Most notably known as the Healthy Heart Doc, Dr. Batiste is a longtime plant based physician who you may know from documentaries like The Game Changers and Eating You Alive. He is the chief of cardiology for Kaiser Permanente Riverside and Moreno Valley Medical Centers. He is also the co-founder and director of integrative cardiovascular disease program at Kaiser Permanente Riverside and an assistant clinical professor at UC Riverside School of Medicine. Oh wait, and the co-founder of the Slave Food Project and also the nonprofit Heart Healthy Nation. Holy moly, welcome the most incredibly busy Dr. Columbus Batiste. Hello there, what's going on? How are you doing? I am so good. Wow, thank you so much for making the time. And for those of you that don't know, it's taken me over three months to get this man in the hot seat because that is how busy he is. So excuse my introduction being so long-winded, but you have a lot on your plate. Uh, you know what, we all have a lot. Yeah. Like years ago, I always say, if you if it's something you want, you're gonna make time, right? And so you make it happen. I love that you say that. And so, actually, be, before we take a deep dive into your practice of lifestyle medicine as a board certified cardiologist, I would first like you to share your personal story of why and when you went vegan. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. I mean, just as briefly as I can, you know, I grew up vegetarian for the most part. I remember having some, uh, you know, my folks weren't completely vegetarian. And so I had some meat that made me, that just made me sick. And I was like, I'm done, you know? And, and shortly thereafter, you know, but I was what you would characterize as junk food of Terry more than anything. Yeah. So like probably many of you out there can relate to that. And it wasn't until kind of really a lot of life situations, because my dad watching him, uh, just disease, eat them alive, literally in terms in front of my eyes and just coming to the realization that there has to be something else that despite all the pills and procedures there has to be something else and i really started to delve deep into the science behind the power of lifestyle and most importantly nutritionally plant-based nutrition and my eyes were open and that was it no turning back at that point and so at least for myself personally and that is just a curve to kind of dip my toe and take that leap of faith to, to go ahead and set myself out there and start telling patients and telling um, uh, colleagues and everything else. And that's never an easy journey when you're doing something different. It's a little bit easier now, not to make it sound like I walk up hill and snow. And, but, you know, I certainly have high level of Esselstyn and, and, and Ornish, the giants out there, but it still wasn't so predominant like it is now. And so I was, I was afraid to be seen as that guy. I mean, as you can tell, I have very rich chocolate tan. And so I'm easily identifiable. And so I, 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 was, I was fearful, if I'm honest, about also being not, in addition to being this, this, this different interventional cardiologist, but also different in another way. And so I had to get over myself and, and do what was right, do the right thing. And that's all she wrote. And I love that you talk about that. So I, 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 fear is the killer of all things. And so how is someone like you who's actually established themselves in the field as, as, as one of the experts, one of the go-tos, as we would call the goats, um, how do you send that message across to people that are letting really letting fear take, stop them from taking the next step? Yeah, you know, it, it goes back to something I learned inside of training, which is be confident in what you know and confident in what you don't bear. And so you don't have to know every single iteration of the science, every newest literature, every newest review, but there's some basic part of those that we all understand and can relate to, which is just we eat more fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, beans, nuts, and seeds, we're better off. Now, how we go about that, just dig down deep into your own cult, into what you do or your family has done maybe not in this current generation, but maybe in generations gone by in the past. And that makes it simple. Just make it relatable and get out of your own way. Now, uh, for those people that don't know, what is lifestyle medicine? Yeah, so, I mean, lifestyle medicine, I'm glad you said lifestyle things instead of alternative. 
because that's probably one of the things that kind of irks me is when people say alternative medicine, which implies it's somewhat less than in that it should be done when you've exhausted everything else. But what the studies clearly have shown is that when we embrace the power of things that you have control over, that's why it's so hard, right? Things you have control over, like your sleep, your mindfulness, the thoughts you choose to put into your mind, right? The foods you choose to put into your body that have a relationship to the world around you, the environment, the animals, your own health, your own microbiome, the relationships you choose to have, uh, how you choose in, in terms of laughing or being angry. Right. All these things play such a unique role in terms of the outcomes of your health. And study after study after study continues to highlight the power of these simple tools. But we don't like simple. We like shy. We like bright. We like new. We like sexy. So we say, give me the stints, doc. Give me the brand new pills, doc. Give me everything else except for what I can do and do what you mean. So that's what lifestyle is. And that's what we all have to get back to. I love that. And now you briefly discussed how you arrived to the advocacy of plant-based medicine as your career focus with the untimely death of actually one very important black man in your life, your father, who died from diabetic complications. But also on your website, you talk about how the impact of your father-in-law's death due to, I guess, renal associated failures due to high blood pressure. Now, what I really want to know is how do these chronic possibly preventable diseases like diabetes, high blood pressure, stroke, even heart disease, disproportionately affect African-Americans, particularly in contrast to white Americans. I think one thing you know is that it is our DNA is our destiny. This is not because of some genetic malformation. This is not because of a genetic predisposition because we actually identify and it's well recognized that race is a social construct. And so if we do the, the, the analogy, if we do the, the timeline, we say race is a social construct, which means it's constructed by human beings to categorize people and individuals into perhaps their, their areas of identification. We also know that racial health disparities are a subset of, social, uh, of, of a social construct. And so when we look at disparities and we look at uh, zip codes of where individuals live, that historically have a level of, of redlining, of this, this demarcation, of the social construct. When we look at access to helpful foods that has this historical perspective of once again being a social construct and, and that dovetails into finances, dovetails into education, right? We walk, if we could, that's a whole different subject for a different day. But what happens as a result is we look that each of them plays a role in terms of the health outcomes of groups of individuals and some of the most uh, 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 affected by it are African-Americans, Latinos, um, indigenous populations are heavily affected still to this day. You know, what's so interesting is that W.B. Du Bois wrote back in the, the, the late 1890s about the state of African-American health. And it's eerily identical to what we're experiencing now. Eerily identical. Whether or not we're, he was speaking to the impact of the Spanish flu and is disproportionate impacting communities of color, whether or not he was speaking to the increased burden of chronic diseases, or we're seeing the same thing evident now. And so the only thing that's similar, despite the, the, the boom in technology, despite the boom in, in every aspect, is the social construct, where we live, work, play, and pray. And that is one of the major causes of why we have this violence. And so when we actually talk about providing solutions, we're talking about here is education and accessibility. And in, though it's easily said, for some reason, it's not so easily done. And so how is it that you as a practitioner, as, as, a, as a doctor who's taken a Hippocratic oath, can work in institutions where we feed our sick poison? You know, so what do we say there? Well, I mean, I think that, I think we all we have to continue the fight. I mean, this has been a lifelong, uh, a generational struggle for equal rights, for opportunity, right, for health and wellness. And so, same thing has to take place inside of inside of these health organizations. And what I could tell you is the fact that in, in the podcast that we we talk about in our platform of Slate Week Project, we talk about resources go where value is placed resources go where value is placed. So if we follow the, the, that thread for a second, healthcare organizations value 
the assessment of patients. Why? Because that, those assessments come back into ratings of the hospital, which then dovetail into reimbursements. If the vast majority of the patients are like, I don't want this food, give me a burger, and their food quality is horrible, or this is horrible, or if there's an increased weight, you're seeing that this transition. But but my I, I say that we have to have a shift in our mindset. As, mm -hmm. as people tell me when I started out my career, Doc, I'm going to give you what you need, not what you ask for. <laughs> it's, it, you may not know exactly what you need, you truly need as a brand new interventional cardiologist. We're going to give you what you need, not what you ask for. When patients come into the hospital, our job as practitioners is one, to have an empathize with them, to provide appropriate care, but that's also evidence and provide them with what they need. Right. Right. And and appropriate care may not be feeding someone a hamburger post uh, a cardiac surgery. And so it's the antithesis of healing. And there's no may not be. It absolutely is not the appropriate care um, for these individuals to receive that whatsoever. And it's, it's it just demonstrates the fact that there's a lot of work left that needs to be done. There's been some subtle progress that's been made in, in, in some institutions and in some in California and New York specifically looking at the construct and the offerings of more plant-rich foods and, uh, and and so forth. But this needs to be more pervasive. It needs to be more uniform and the standard as opposed to the exception. And we absolutely need governmental intervention, policy intervention to change the status quo, making it greener by default, um, primarily. And I'm, you know, we're so lucky to have physicians like you that, that, that do think this way. Um, but I do want to touch up briefly on what you're talking about, the Slave Food Project, because I don't think enough people know about it. And maybe the name may may deter someone from seeing it. But I think it is so amazing what you're talking about here. So I'd love for you to share what viewers can expect to find. Yeah, you know, I mean, the, the name is definitely controversial and it's something that jumps out there. But it's really what, what they characterize as a double entendre. Yes, we, to, I mean, I'm a history lover. I think in a different light, I live in history. It's how much I'm in history. And I'm just saying is why uh, things exist and how we, we reach to this point. But nevertheless, so slave was the double entendre. Yes, it goes to the historical aspect and the impact of, of the enslaved. And when we look at the enslaved and specifically addressing the African American community, that we think oftentimes of the reflection of, of soul food. That we think of all these things that, People say, well, this is my culture, this is my heritage. And so we outline really the effect of how our eating habits were formed throughout the period of time from the enslavement through the Great Migration to even in terms of civil rights and in modern day soul, right? So we describe this journey, how that's actually not your heritage, how the heritage goes back to the roots in terms of Africa or in terms of other groups. We look at the indigenous, the original uh, diet of where they they arise from. And so as we craft this story of how things were altered and how you were given the reps, the things that the uh the all the slave masters didn't want at that point in time. And then you add you you advance that over to modern times, right? To modern times that now we're given essentially the same type of foods in the form of processed junk and discarded that many of the people who run these these companies they won't even allow their own lips to touch. They won't drink the sodas. They won't eat the fast food. Then we look at how these, our cities have been constructed in terms of being crucibles of conflict, in terms of stress, but we also look at the level of nutritional stress that's in, that's there from the just the placement of the fast food. So when the civil rights uh, 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 era began, you had disruption of cities. That Nixon and Small Business Association loans came in and they revitalized cities, which was wonderful. What they did was they squeezed out grocery stores, brought in liquor stores, brought in fast food places, having government subsidized foods that led to death and demise of people who were in close proximity to, which studies that continually validate. When we look at this, along with the, the, the subsidies for individuals who are, who are financially impaired and rely upon government for subsidies, all these things play a role. And so we talk about this and I'll, I'll end it with this. I remember when I began my journey, I told you that I had junk stereo. 
I'm I'm at the grocery store, just like everybody else. I got my vegetables. I had my Swiss chard. I had everything. Just I was rolling, right? In the t- I get to the checking count, checkout line, and I, of course I choose the wrong lot, like everybody else. And I'm there, and so everything's just calling you. The candy bars are calling you, They're like Columbus. <laughs> Hey, what you doing? And I look, I'm like, he's talking to me. <laughs> Last minute, I just grab her and put it on the conveyor on the belt, right? And I look up like nobody's seen me. I'm 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 a grown man, but I'm still looking like nobody's seen me. The child clerk says to me, I'll never forget these words. Man, I thought you were the healthiest person I'd ever seen until I thought you were just like the rest of us. Addicted. Enslaved. Enslaved means I do not want to do this. But somehow I'm chained to these foods. They continue the attachment despite understanding having full knowledge of the negative impact it will have on my body, my health, and my future. That whether or not it's for a person who's, who's trying to get off of meat, the impact on the environment, our animals, and we begin to see all this that despite this, I'm still enslaved based upon the, the construct, the way that it's been packaged and put together. The layers from psychology in terms of the advertisement, all the way down to the refinement of the chemicals for the, the, the bliss that's there. And I realize that we're all still enslaved. All of us, whether our color, our gender, our race, our creed, any of these things that we all are and that we need to break this cycle. We need to build and change and there's a better way for us all. That that's- Wow. That is deep. For for you guys that don't know that have not checked out the Slave Project, shame on you. It is moderated by his lovely wife. And they have a wonderful guest like Dr. Milton Mills and Tracy McCorder. I have taken a deep dive into the Slave Project and I I am obsessed. Um, and so we need more work like that done by people like you. And so thank you for sharing that with us. Um, but what, you know, what I really love is I wanted to know was why was the creation of Healthy Heart Nation, that nonprofit so important for you? Like what more did you seek to provide the community through this organization that you actually couldn't do with Kaiser Permanente or through the academic institution in which you teach? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, when, when we look at, at the aspects of health, it extends beyond this. One thing, one thing for me is education. And let me, let me take a step back. So I remember in practice, I had a patient where uh, she was what we would now call a frontline worker. That, the, that terminology, she was not African-American, had a young family, had a heart attack, recommended medications for her, cardiac rehab, a lifestyle. She couldn't make the appointment. Why? Because she had to work. And so continually she had repeated heart attacks before she passed away and i'm looking there just troubled over the layers of what we could not provide just not available to us and so in that moment i began to kind of think you know we need more we need to look at dive into um, a way in which we can approach this and so thankfully i didn't want to get involved in the board that's once i formed healthy heart nation but my wife and the board and the people we selected for the board they said, you know what, Columbus, listen, you're always talking about where you live, work, play, and pray. We need to, to ad- address this holistic. We need to not just address the nutrition and the health, but also the health of the That this, the, the community, health of an individual is just a reflection of the health of the community. So we need to address the education piece. We need to address the business piece or financial. We need to address the, the justice aspect. We need to, to address in terms of community services as a whole on top of the health. And so that was the premise and that was the foundation with the goal to provide scholarships to students trying to seek high, uh, uh, higher education mentorship, trying to provide educational series for individuals, trying to put on, we're, you know, thank me, I'm excited. We're about to put on our first conference called the Health Conference, Health Equity Lifestyle Project. It will take place in Huntsville, Alabama, right? And it's the home of historically black colleges and universities, the heart attack belt of the South, right? And the goal is to really emphasize the power of nutrition for transforming everything from the trauma infant mortality to diabetes to cardiovascular health to Alzheimer's and mental health as a whole. Then looking at what's the role in the intersection between places of faith, places of higher education, businesses, and really instilling and revitalizing the health. Because we all 
have a responsibility to be, to live, move beyond yourself. It was Muhammad Ali who said, you know, I, uh, service is, is my rent I pay for being on this earth, right? And so we all have a greater obligation than just our day job to block, give money, buy new cars, do all the take vacations, post on IG about, you know, I'll live my best life. I love that. And I, I hope that that inspires people here to say, you know, to see and do more. Um, there's always, we can always find the excuse that there's just not enough time. But then again, that's the choice we make, right? And you're you're making some different choices and, and we really appreciate that. All right, sorry, I have to say, right? So it's not, it doesn't get easy. So we started out, we started something called the pressure Project where we go into barbershops and we're putting blood pressure machines at barbershops, beauty salons, and churches. And so we're the pube of my, and I'll tell you to those that people saying like, oh, I don't have enough time. I'm busy, right? I'm, I to me when I say I'm busy, but like my, the wife doesn't let me, let me say, that. so on the weekends when I rest, guess where I'm at? A barbershop, yeah. doing blood pressure screens, talking to people about their nutrition, collaborating with Diet ID, to, to assess your blood, their diet nutrition on the spot and giving them advice for free. I mean, I'm not getting paid for that, but that's just, it's an act of service that's so important. And I will tell you that when I meet individuals, like individual I met this past week, two individuals, one whose blood pressure was 180 over 100 round that we sent to the emergency room or another individual who had a significant health challenge after you identified this blood pressure has made changes towards moving towards vegan uh, uh, lifestyle and eating. That's rewarding. So even though I'm giving up myself, I'm actually receiving way more than I give when I recognize the fact that I can have a domino effect, not only in this individual's life, the life of those that they're surrounded by. And so that's what I would I would pose to people is that, yes, you're busy, but studies have shown that when you volunteer, that when you give up yourself, you're going to give back way more than you're giving. And it, it extends itself into longevity of years lived lower blood pressure, improved cardiovascular health. So you actually are empowering yourself. It's actually selfish when you give up yourself. That's true. Plenty of research that goes to defend servant leadership and its many benefits. Um, and so that that ex ex exceeds educational leadership, right? We were talking about having true health impacts, not just for the communities you reach, but for individuals themselves. And so that's beautiful. I, I, I love that you brought that up. Do more people, basically, is what he's saying. Uh, so for those of you Be Kind Connects people that don't know, I actually had the pleasure of meeting uh, Dr. Batiste here at the live taping of the Exam Room podcast hosted by our friend Chuck Carroll, where leaders like you and Dr. Neil Bernard and Dr. Christy Funk were discussing in detail the physiological impacts of eating meat or animal-based products like dairy. But what we really didn't tap into too much there was what about those people that advocate for a lifestyle of moderation? Like, what are the cumul cumulative effects of engaging in poor lifestyle behaviors, but in moderation? I, I think I think I analogize it. Simple way I bring it up to people is that I prescribe medic, still prescribe pills. So here's a place and a time for breathing medication. But here's the thing: what I realized early on, I can give one individual a small amount, and they have a horrific response. I can give another person a large amount and their response doesn't take place till later on if they have it at all. The same thing happens when we eat these foods. We eat the foods that have been continually shown to be detrimental. That yes, you may not have an immediate response, but trust me, this response is, it's laying its foothold beneath the surface before it manifests itself. It reminds me of when I was too, too smart for my own self and I, I left college, drove from uh, back east, back to the west coast. And I took my car into the mechanic and they said, you know, you shouldn't put that car on the road. I said, you think I just born yesterday? This car's been running around fine. I'm good. I got on that road. I started driving past all these states. And all of a sudden the engine started. Mm. <laughs> now the mechanic could keep that when I was going to break down. He told me he's of wear and tear that based upon what I was doing, it was going to break down what I think the key that people have to, to recognize when you embrace this idea and concept of moderation. Moderation does truly kill. Uh, and, and and you have to really wage every day. Is this is this adding to my life? Is it part of what my goal is? If my plan is 
if my impression is I want to live a healthful life, my plan every day is I have to choose what I eat wise. I have to choose to move more than I sit. I have to I have to work out inside that 114 degree heat and talk to it like it's a sauna, right? Man. <laughs> this is so funny. He's giving me he's giving me a hard time because I just moved to Vegas that I'm missing my beach workouts on the daily. So my spoiled my spoiled accessibility life there. But um you're right. It it is a matter of choice and um and every choice has a cost. You know, you just want to know whether it's short term or long term. And so I like that we're touching on this because your physician just specializes in interventional cardiology. And so I'd like you to tell our viewers what really are the real costs associated for eating an animal based diet compared to a plant based diet? Like, for example, uh, like what example, what type of long term care is required after you have like an angioplasty? Um, if these clients don't change their lifestyle, are they looking at another surgery down the road? Yeah. So I think, I think what we know first and foremost, that there's roughly 700 to 800,000 heart attacks that happen every single day. And of that, about 30 to 35% are from a second, third or fourth heart. That means that, that over 30%, a third are happening from a second, third. So you look at this and here's the key. The vast majority are silent heart attacks. You never know you have them. So when our special Indiana Jones is out right now, so he's an archaeologist. You think back in the day, we have our ar archaeologists of the healthcare field are called pathologists. And when pathologists go in and they uncover and explore and figure out exactly what happens in it, it oftentimes they find uh, heart attacks that healed upon healed heart attacks before one that each What I can tell you is that every day, these decisions that we make by having an animal-based diet that increases our inflammation, that increases our risk, in terms of, 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 of having an adverse event. And there's direct correlation that we've seen continually. It exposes you, it places you at risk for heart attack. Now, does that mean it's gotta be 100% of people? No, but you don't know if you're gonna be part of the 95% the that may get it or the 5% who won't. Are you gonna be that 110 year old who's eating hot dogs and smoking cigarettes? Or are you gonna be part of that 30 year old who's suffering with a heart attack and the 50 year old? You know, for those of us who've been in education a long time, we understand there's a Gaussian bell distribution. 95% of us are smack dab. Everything we do has profound consequences. 2.5% on either way. It's I have early onset of events or 2.5% on the other end. Hey, I can do whatever I want. And somehow I escaped major uh, catastrophe. We cannot base our decisions off that 2.5% that may be able to live and cause harm to the environment, animals, and their own health. And so let's let's talk about those standard deviations or what we call those outliers, right? What percentage of your clients, let's just put this in ballpark, are plant-based that have needed medical intervention, like a cardiovascular kind of repair, uh, compared to those eat meat, eating meat-centric diets patients? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I have not met someone who is whole food plant-based who comes in with an acute heart attack and requires uh, stenting. I have met individuals who have made the transition after an event into eating healthfully and who perhaps need to have still additional procedures or medications done as their, their, their body has sustained injury from prior years. I have met individuals who've eaten uh, a version of the standard American diet, which is unhelpful, like I talked about, a junk vegetarian who required. But when those who've eaten uh, aggressively a whole food plant-based diet without a history of events, I have seen nothing but success for those individuals clinic and have not sustained events. Now, there's, everyone's going to be different. And so granted, I'm not, I'm not making a broad sweeping statement that it's impossible, but I'm saying your odds are improved astronomically. And also when we think about people, um, in terms of BMI or obesity factors that are needing assistance, like angioplasties or heart, uh, bypass surgeries, uh, we have to think that there is a correlation or relationship between that and obesity. So when we start looking at this in a whole, like what impacts does obesity actually have on genes and the possible inheritance of these genes that maybe genetically predispose them to obesity? It, it starts to get deep, it starts to get deep. And we're, we're seeing that we know we're learning more and more about the epigenome. And so what was that around 1990 when Randy Jurdo out of, I think it was Duke, 
discovered the epigenes and, and so forth, dealing with the goody mice. And we've see, since this the field has grown exponentially, we're learning that every aspect plays a role. But the key thing we see too, as well, is we see that our epigenes play, uh, excuse me, obesity plays a substantial role even in destabilization of, of plaques in the coronary arteries that can lead to heart attacks. They can increase the risk of sudden death. It increases the risk of, of irregular heartbeats called heat fibrillation. It increases the risk as well of complications if, God forbid, you need to have some sort of procedure. So we, so we see all of these things, and, 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 and that tells us a, a level of concern that when we're having animal products, we're having the increase in insulin like growth hormone factor and all these other aspects are stimulating this excessive growth because the hormones are injected to animals that then come over and transfer to us. We're seeing this vicious cycle of disease. And I'm not even mentioning the microbiome <laughs> to even go into that. Um, and I love that you talk about this uh, accumulation because, well, one thing I, I, I want to preface that the reason why you're a lifestyle physician, lifestyle medicine physician, is that you also talk about the importance of physical activity. Because we do see now evidence in the research literature that this obesity increasing effect may actually be attenuated by physical activity. So there you go. Your epigenetic factors are basically saying your fate isn't quite sealed yet if you can moderate some other things going on in your lifestyle. Yeah, absolutely. I have to be Peloton or a major Olympic gym. You just have to get deep, not exercise, activity, thermogenesis, stand more, move more, walk more, fidget more. All these things add up to significant impact in terms of your overall metabolic health. So I, I like that we're going on this because we're starting to actually see a lot of information on the risk of antibiotic resistance occurring in humans due to their consumption of meat and dairy products because we're seeing that like over 80% of antibiotics are actually fed to animals and animal agriculture. So. I wanted to know, uh, this may not be your focus of research, but what is your perspective on the ideology of this bioaccumulation of antibiotics, antifungals, or antimicrobials found in our food system that actually could it impact our health? Absolutely. I mean, there's great concern right now in size of the med we have to for high bioconsistence. And we're, and we're seeing it. We're seeing, obviously, animals are injected with antibiotics, part of the whole uh, for animal farming and so forth, and this leads to such tremendous detriment to uh, to uh, to individuals. So it translates over, them. and we see this really as it plays out every single day. Combined with the fact, when you go into doctors, people are just looking for antibiotics. It's not, it's, and so uh, this is a significant area. I think that when we look in the realm of foods that we consume, it's an untapped area in the medical profession in terms of looking at the impact that this can have on reducing the edible is looking at the the uh the foods that we accept. amazing and so considering the ideology that the the impacts that obesity has on gene inheritance do you think that antibiotic resistance actually has the same capability but to trigger obesity not trigger obesity, but having antibiotic resistance actually transferred to the next generation. Yeah, I, I would not, I have not seen studies on that, but it would not surprise at all at the, as we learn more and more about the epigenome. You know, I've, I've been amazed at some of the things that we find are, are inheritable based on epigenes. And so it would not surprise me uh, at all. And then as well, we understand that culturally, in terms of even if it's not something that's genetically passed on, we understand that the environments, most of the, the, the issues that we get are from the cookbook, the environment, the lifestyle, the eating habits. And so we look at the impact of the microbiome and deficiencies, the lack of, of variability inside that microbiome that gets passed alone because the eating habits get passed alone. And so we have this impact and this susceptibility. And so there's so many layers to this. That, right. and that and that's the thing that just excites me. It's so interesting. It's so broad. But it's so keen, you know, in terms of in terms of the. Um, I just have two more questions. And I'm gonna let you go because you're just so uh, you're so wonderful to converse with. But lately, we've seen a rise or an approval of cell based meat. We see the approval in Singapore, and then good meat and upside foods and good meat were certified for production sale in the United States. So I wanted to know what your perspective was on cell-based meat or cultivated meat. Um, 
as it's grown from animal cells, would it be presumptive to assume that this type of clean meat would still have the same type of physiological effects to our cardiovascular system or our coronary health, given that it's made from real animals? So obviously we have a great question and I've had this discussion kind of flying and you know, we don't have the research yet, but what I would, my presumption is, is that this is great for the environment and great for animals, but for our overall health, the human health, I have great deal of concern that the impact that's going to be there in terms of, well, perhaps we're not going to get antibiotic resistance from animals, but we still have the risk presumptively of trimethylamine oxide, one of the main components that leads to atherosclerosis or the hardening or coronary artery disease progression in the microbiome from animal proteins. We understand still the impact of animal proteins in general, the stimulation of insulin growth bite like factor, all these things theoretically would still be there. And this 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 uh, this issue that we're dealing with in America right now, it's a healthcare crisis, and uh, the center piece of it is our nutrition. Well, thank you so much for your for your input on that. Um, but I'd like to close it out with something about you because we've got something coming up in the next year that you guys have got to get your hands on. The word on the street is that you're coming out with a book called "Get Selfish and Live a Life of Purpose." Tell us a little about it, about a little bit about it, and when we can get act, get our hands on it. Yeah, so this is a passion project. It's it's really my yeah. approach of accumulating patients I've taken care of over over time, and some of the things that I've learned, said, and said. Selfish is an acronym that um, really is the pillars of health. And how what I'm describing is that selfish is begins to ask with spiritual, and that's necessarily in a spirit in a religious way. But whether or not it's breathing, whether or not it is actually meditation or mindfulness or actual prayer, and really the power that that has in our decision making, our stress levels, but not just that, our the lining of our vessels and our heart function. So in this particular series, I'm bringing out how each of these pillars impacts not only stress, it impacts our decision making, it impacts our overall health, but specifically our heart health to really heal the stress and broken heart. So we move from spiritual to exercise. This goes without saying, we to love. You say, well, love, doc, and you're a heart doctor you're saying love? I'm like, no, no, no. It's because anyone who's loved anything, anybody, or at all, they understand that love is not a noun, it's a verb. Love takes action. Love includes uh, forgiveness. Uh, love is, is gratitude. Love is actually volunteering. That these things and showing and demonstrating how each of these things impacts stress and our overall heart health. Then we move to food, the central piece of selfish and the central piece of our, our lifestyle journey. And then on from food of whole food, plant rich foods to the intimacy of relationships. That relationships are predominantly with humans, but also with animals. It's showing how the oxytocin effect, showing how the bonding and, and, and the literature is really showing the impact. We've all experienced this during the pandemic. And then finally, moving over to the second S, which is that of sleep, something we all we all curtail when the times get busy. And last, humor. One of the things I learned a long time ago, I started asking patients, I actually asked a colleague, I was hosting a chief reader with the chiefs, and I, I saw uh, one of my colleagues who's a chief, and I said, he was looking stressed. I said, man, tell me, what's the last time you just laughed? You did something by <laughs> yourself. He looked at me, he's like, what? I said, not for your kids, not for your wife, what's the last time you I can't think of something. I said, past week, two, I said, I want you to find something. Whether or not it's a dirty joke, don't judge. <laughs> not it's a comedy show, movie, whatever you gotta find, find something to laugh because of the power of laughter on our health. It truly is medicine. And so that's really what selfish is about. And so I weave in stories of, of a of a conglomerate of patients uh, throughout this. And so I'm looking forward to sharing this with the world and hopefully changes some lives can recognize I gotta get self and now I think that is a selfish lifestyle we could all learn to wrap ourselves in so that wraps up this edition of VKind Connects with the Healthy Heart Doc to learn more about Dr. Columbus Batiste his upcoming events projects and initiatives please go to thehealthyheartdoc.org and to watch this episode and many more check out www.thekindconnects.com and I'll see you next time Oh, 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 oh,